Good evening, this is the Oscar expert here with Brother Bro, and it's time to review The Batman. This is directed by Matt Reeves, which is very exciting, since Matt Reeves did Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, which I hold in very, very high regard. It War of the Planet of the Apes, let me in. This wasn't just a random DC Batman film. This was a, a real movie to look forward to. And now after this, he's gonna be seen as a beacon of light for blockbuster auteur cinema. Really, you know, when you hold this up to a Marvel film, it's just, it's, it's night and day. One of them has a very distinct style. The other is really just not that concerned with having a style looking a certain way. The Batman borrows from many genres. The David Fincher detective movie, noir. It almost looks black and white except for the red. It's orange. It's all red. It's like almost always orange. Well, to me it's red. I think we want to go into spoiler territory, but we're going to save it for the end and tell you when we're going to talk about that. But as far as non-spoilers go, you know, we're already talking about the cinematography. Greg Frazier has solidified himself as one of the most exciting cinematographers. We're talking heavy practical lighting where all the light sources are diegetic to the scene. He's not really a big fan of fill light. He doesn't really care if the characters are dark in the face, but he'll always give you that like nice edge light, that nice side light. I feel like the decision to make it nighttime the entire movie it's a bold visual choice one that sacrifices realism for the sake of style it's almost a strangely consistent color palette like it doesn't change throughout the entire movie it's stylized to the point where the car chase scene felt like a visual light show, which almost takes priority over actually being able to tell what is going on in a very clear way. Yeah, I did think that scene suffered a little bit from not being able to tell what was going on, but it almost didn't matter because the style gives you what you're supposed to be feeling, like that claustrophobia. Barely being able to see what is going on almost heightens the tension of that scene, so I wouldn't even take too much away from it. It's also always raining in the movie. And also the production yeah. design, you see that gothic architecture, especially in Bruce Wayne's mansion. I definitely thought the production design throughout was pretty amazing. I love the club as well. A lot of what this film does is paints a portrait of Gotham City. And as the film goes on, we discover the seediness and the corruption. I did want more Bruce Wayne slash Robert Pattinson giving him a little bit more range in this performance because even when he is Bruce Wayne, he's just like, I feel afraid. And I get that the character is like very depressed in this film, so it makes sense. I was kind of okay with it leaning into the emo acting style, maybe with the exception of not really feeling behind the romance in the film. I didn't know exactly how they wanted me to be buying the romance because it itself felt stylized or like just for show or just part of the genre that you were expecting, but it didn't feel necessary to the story for there to be this weirdly platonic love affair between Batman and Catwoman. I feel like that goes along a little bit with like the style of the acting here. Catwoman is very much a femme fatale, not just in how she's written, but like her seductiveness. I'm not really criticizing it for that, but it felt more like an exercise for the sake of the genre or style. Yeah, I thought the romance felt a little silly. It's like, oh, we're, we're, we're kissing right now. I did like the character of Catwoman though, because I think she presents a good foil for the Batman. And there's a moment at the end where you can see how that character was like worth having in the movie. A lot of the side characters were really fun. Colin Farrell as the Penguin was just thoroughly shocked that it was even him under there. I could kind of tell in his eyes, but other than that, like the voice is totally foreign. The facial expressions that he gets to play with are really impressive because that's like the makeup giving him an opportunity to make all these weird faces that he normally wouldn't be able to. Yeah, the makeup wasn't constraining at all. It was really impressive. It was also a really funny character. It's, it feels like there's a lot more left of him in the future, and I know we're getting a TV series. The main villain here is the Riddler. Paul Dano's the Riddler. I was just so happy, so pleased pleased and thrilled that we get this amazing Paul Dano performance. The character might have been difficult to take seriously if he didn't play it so convincingly and terrifyingly. Even when he's in his leather suit where you can only see his eyes and hear his voice, that terror is coming through. I think this is really a performance and a villain in general to cherish. I would also say it's the strongest and most memorable performance in the film. I agree, I love the incel energy coming off of him. Also really liked Andy Serkis and Jeffrey Wright. Andy Serkis especially has this one very emotional scene that brought my heart into the movie in a way that it wasn't up until that point. And then Zoe Kravitz, I fully expect to be highly sought after after this film. I think she did an awesome job and I also love the makeup on her. I like that this movie trusts the audience to pay close attention because there's a lot of plot details and it also trusts the audience in having a little bit slower of a pace. It really does put a lot of faith in its audience to be interested in a three hour long film that is mostly a detective 
drama, but I felt strongly watching it that most people are gonna be on board for it. I think a film like this is meant to test, you know, what an audience comes into a film and expects and what will make them feel like they got a rewarding experience. And it goes to show that you don't need to have tons of action for people to feel invested. Nor do you have to talk down to or pander to like a younger audience. It definitely had my mind running throughout the three hours and I did not get bored once. I thought there was a very satisfying amount of action throughout the movie. I thought the choreography was excellent and it very much avoids rapid cutting so that you can see the fighting playing out. The sound throughout is also excellent. Like not just in the action scenes where we expect it to be good and where it's like rumbling throughout your entire seat, but even just Batman's footsteps and little details like that. There was a lot of meticulous attention in every scene, and I really think it deserves an Academy Award nomination there. My main criticism is that it felt too simple and tidy, despite feeling like it was gonna have a more complex setup. All of the details as to why I'm gonna include in the spoiler portion. So I did expect more out of it, but I'm still really happy with what we got. I was happy that this movie had a definitive character arc because a lot of comic book movies seem to avoid having their characters be too flawed lest they affect people's perception of the character based on the comics and make them not like 100% a squeaky clean amazing hero. I would also say there weren't any moments where I was like absolutely enthralled with it. I was just mostly very engaged with it, with the style, the performances, the pacing. And I thought it was a well woven story. And I like how it's willing to juggle multiple villains. And I am excited to see where this universe goes next. We didn't even talk about mm. the score. Oh, I feel yeah. like everybody said already that it's amazing, but it's really great. Think that it could get nominated for the Oscar. I do. I think this movie probably has sound. I don't know. I don't know if I want to say in the bag, but like, I think it's probably going to get a sound nomination, mm -hmm. probably a makeup nomination and score, I think has a decent shot. But you know, then again, like Tenet and French Dispatch not getting it. I mean, it shows that if you're out of the conversation, you can just be totally gone. So we don't know. I think production design would be worthy, but I'm not going to predict that. I don't think I would either. I think cinematography is very possible. I mean, yeah, Batman Begins got a cinematography nomination. And Greg Frazier might even have an Oscar by next Oscars. On a good day, I'm with a little campaigning from Warner Brothers if they choose to do that. We could see a screenplay happen. Maybe. Mm. I'm not going to say pictures out of the conversation. I wouldn't put it in like my top 10 probably. But I'm not dismissive. Like some people are very dismissive. Like, nope, no way. It's in March. Like, it's gonna make a ton of money. People are gonna know about it. Like, it is a freaking 4.4 on Letterboxd. Everybody's loving it, so I'm just not gonna well, count not, it not out. everybody, though. The critic reviews aren't absolutely stellar. It's yeah, like a 72 or 73 on Metacritic. And I don't care, because Joker, like, also yeah, didn't have true. the best reviews. I don't know. This definitely has the art house prestige that a superhero film or a comic book film might need to get into Best Picture. So it does like tick those boxes where I'm not gonna say it's out because it's a superhero movie. I mean, we have the precedent with The Dark Knight getting eight nominations and Joker getting 11. So people might even expect this movie to be in the conversation. I mean, I mean even Black Panther got nominations and that came out in February. I can't tell where it's gonna be at at the end of this year, but I do think it'll be honored in some texts and I definitely root for all of those texts. I wouldn't even hate a Best Picture nomination. All right, now we're gonna get into spoiler territory. I was really fascinated with the film when it seemed like Batman's parents were not the heroes that he thought they were. And the Riddler keeps saying stuff throughout the movie like, you're a part of this. And then the audience is left going, oh my God, what role does Batman play in this puzzle? And you know, it's been compared to movies like Seven and Chinatown. So I kind of expected something much darker or more sinister at the end of this tunnel, especially given some of the genres it was playing into, like film noir. I didn't think that there were any revelations that were that shocking. I mean, the Bruce Wayne's parents revelation is sort of walked back where it's like, oh, you know, they made a mistake, but they weren't bad like all the other rich billionaires in the town. They were the only somewhat good ones. And that's probably because it's a little bit beholden to the comics. You can't turn Bruce Wayne's dad into a villain if you don't want to have an angry mob after you, but I did feel like if they did go there, I might have liked it better. The movie did lead me to believe that we were gonna unearth some darker layer of Batman. And it's more just that he has to revise his methods. I don't know if it felt like we dived into that character or into Batman as a personality. He really just has to uh, revise his intentions, actually. He goes from vengeance to serving the good of humanity. I think it's a good character arc overall, but for me, it wasn't quite enough. I understand that my reading that I'm about to explain to you of this film, it's not necessarily like the thread that the film wants me to follow, 
But I was trying to like look a little bit more critically at the movie. I think when people watch superhero films, they're very receptive to getting a sort of like lesson or parable of morality. Like the MCU often will dive into like the motivations of the villain and you know where they're going wrong as opposed to like what the protagonist's intentions are. And the message is always that the good guys and the bad guys, you know, they might be similar, they might even be foils of one another, but one is just not willing to put other people in harm's way to achieve their ends. It's not a bad message, but over time, like, that gets really freaking boring. That's like the bare template that we're working with here. And I think in this film, it's sort of the same in a weird way. Batman never has to really question whether his actions are good or bad. Well, no, he does question if they're good or bad. He says, I don't think I had the effect on the city that I wanted to. I love the opening scene where Batman's like, I am the shadows, I am fear. And I like how in the end, he moves away from that because he realizes that being a symbol of fear and violence isn't getting him the results that he wants. Because every bad character in the film, like the Penguin or the Riddler, is also inspired by vengeance. And the Riddler says, you showed me all it takes is a little fear and violence. And then the Batman inspired him. The movie is very concerned with what Batman represents to Gotham City. And not everybody necessarily sees him the way that he wants them to. Like, he doesn't have control over whether or not somebody can tell that he's fighting for good or if he's just beating the shit out of bad guys. And that's why I like Catwoman's character, because at the end, she decides, well, I got what I wanted, I got my vengeance, and now I'm out of here. And that's where they kind of split, because he says, well, I actually want to try to be something more what Gotham needs. What the movie does well is that it paints this interesting picture of Gotham, and it's more about where Batman fits into that rather than being a character study. I agree with your point that there was something stronger they could have gone for with looking at Bruce Wayne's father, and they really just let him off the hook by making him this good person. It gave Batman sort of permission to not really change what he's doing. I think they kind of meet it like halfway, because he does end up questioning whether he's doing good or harm in the film, which is good. But I think it could have gone further. I really tried to read the world as being similar to our own. There's a like weird reading that I did, and I know it's weird, where Batman is a billionaire who is trying to fight blue collar crime. And in our world, when that happens, when politicians like crack down on crime, it doesn't go very well. It doesn't really end up benefiting society. And like maybe this film does have a take that Batman may or may not be benefiting society, given where he's coming from and his reflection on himself towards the end. That is the take. He also believes that his father was the victim of a blue collar crime, in which case he's very vengeful in, in an unhealthy way. I guess it did do that. Like I didn't really pick up on it while I was watching it. It didn't feel like it went there for me, but you know, as I'm reflecting about it and you saw it twice, I think it does try to go there. So maybe I had the wrong reading the first time, where my reading was that it lets him off the hook a little bit too much. He does realize that he was maybe on a bad track, but in general, like the crimes he's stopping from happening are crimes that are worth stopping. Like it is so unambiguous when he saves the man off of the subway from the bullies, like just attacking him. The key moment there though, is that the one member of the gang who was very unsure whether he should go through with it, at the end of the scene when Batman beats everybody up, he says, please don't hurt me. Like he didn't pick up on Batman as like a hero coming in. He was just kind of in fear of Batman. Okay, that's, oh, that's interesting, that's interesting. But he's not actually trying to stop the white collar crime, which is really fucking over people. And maybe again, that's his character arc. He, he moves he, into the Riddler's world. The Riddler is the one who's fighting the white collar crime. Yeah, the, the Riddler is actually taking down the system. The Riddler is taking down the system with the help of Batman. The Riddler mm. is getting Batman to fight the white collar crime for him. Actually, you know what? I actually think that's interesting. I definitely thought on my first viewing that the Riddler really had the potential to be the hero of the story because as somebody who's willing to utilize social media to expose people, like you, you could actually be a hero by doing that. But then they make him, you know, very unsavory as this incel who's very neurotic okay. and willing to be a terrorist. Like that's where you completely lose the character. And so I, I wonder if the audience comes away like being able to dismiss somebody like that or if we're kind of in the middle, like we dismiss the tools that he will use to achieve his ends, which we should, but we're also maybe like Batman and we see that, you know, there there's someone actually trying to do good somewhere in here. There was a lot of you and me are the same, you know, we're both coming from the same place as orphans. And the thing with the Riddler and the Batman both being orphans, you know, Batman grows up surrounded by money and the media pays attention to his pain and nobody pays attention to the Riddler's pain, but they're both orphaned. Like, I think that's where the Riddler has so little 
little trust in the system that he resorts to something so chaotic and where Batman has a little more trust in being able to like kind of work within it. I also think that moment where Batman gets really mad at the Riddler when he says, you, we're just the same. And he's like, no, you're a psychopath. That was a really good moment for Batman because he'd be so angry at the idea that they could be similar. And then it's not black and white where Batman is the good guy and Riddler is the bad guy. I think they maybe could have leaned a little harder into Batman maybe like being like a not so good guy. And in the end, he's an unambiguously a hero, which is, I didn't expect that either. I was kind of expecting a Chinatown ending or something where there's no telling whether he's good or not. Well, it's like he's starting to change his image. And there's the part where I think is pretty, actually pretty powerful where he's offering a hand to people out of the water. And at first people look kind of afraid of him and then they slowly start to warm up to him. I like that he didn't complain completely saved the day. Like he did a little bit of good, definitely. Like, he probably saved some people from dying, but overall he wasn't really able to stop the Riddler and he's not able to stop the corruption. The Riddler is actually the one who caused a reckoning within society, like somewhat effectively by manipulating Batman to take down these heads, uh, mainly like John Turturro, right? Who's also really good in this. Oh yeah, who, who we forgot to mention is really good. And you know, for a little bit, like he was kind of effective in removing the leader, but they do imply that they're probably just going to prop up somebody else and somebody's going to make a power grab because fundamentally the system hasn't changed. They've just taken out one of the people who's within it. Well, it's um, been so weakened that now there's a gap that the Riddler's going to try to fill and the Penguin's going to try to fill and everyone's mm. going to try to fill this gap of power. The mayor's going to try oh, to mm. get control over the city because now the city is like flooded and destabilized. I, you know, what? I'm not going to give a definitive rating because I have revised my position throughout the course of this review. I, I was going to give it an eight, which is not bad at all. Like I did not dislike this movie. But I don't think I could fairly say, like, it, it, that's what it is for me because it actually did a lot of things that I wanted to do and I just didn't really pick up on it. <laughs> yeah, I did think it was worth seeing it again. I told you you should see it again. But it still does feel like those moments where it is touching on that theme are kind of few and far between in the grand scheme of, like, the whole detective story and everything. It sometimes does take a back seat. Yeah, like, I was really trying to look for that and I didn't even completely find it so I could see some people coming away without that message. You know, maybe even if I see it, I'll be like, ah, I don't know, I wanted to go a little harder. They could have gone harder on it. But, but at the same time, I think maybe they're not going too hard because it would isolate some people. Like, you can't just yeah. completely destroy the Batman. I swear to God, though, someone probably died in the fucking car chase. But the movie kind of ignored that and pretended like mm, that wasn't a problem, that nobody died in favor of just having the cool car chase sequence, which I can accept. I'll go with like a good eight on this one. Matt Reeves' second best movie, in my opinion, behind Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. And you can check out my thoughts on all the Apes movies because I recently did that. Yeah, very, very good analysis on the Apes films, I, I would say. Thanks for your support, buddy. Yeah, you know, I'm very supportive. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Can you flap your wings like a bat?